I was there in the, under the group of Vaughn. I did my diploma thesis with Vaughn uh, back in, in Geneva and then sort of strayed away for some time. And now I'm back on the correct path and I know something. <laughs> Anyways. Story that, that that we have that I'm going to try to summarize very quickly right now and uh, just zoom into one particular aspect of that story. So the story is as follows: um, we have informal nets, and then there's the, the main claim is that those uh, are the objects of a three category. Um, then there's a theorem of Jacob Lurie that says that um, uh, in any n categories, so there's this notion of, uh, I've mentioned it in, in that talk, uh, what this means. There's this notion of fully dualizable object, and uh, there's a one to one correspondence between fully dualizable objects of an arbitrary n category and uh, topological quantum field theories with values in that. Um, in that category. Okay, so now let's take the three category of conformal nets, uh, and the natural question if you see that theorem is to say, okay, what are the fully dualizable objects? What are the, what are the fully dualizable conformal nets? And uh, so, so we can answer that, that question, that sort of um, sort of like one order of magnitude easier than what, what Jacob Lurie did, uh, which is to say that the conformal net has, uh, is fully dualizable if and only if it has uh, finite u index. And u index is a numerical invariant, um, it's actually the index of a subfactor that you can construct naturally from the conformal net. If that index is finite, then the conformal net will produce this, um, this feature. Uh, Natural next question is for which conformal nets is this numerical invariant finite? And as far as uh, loop group conformal nets are concerned, uh, I, I know that uh, <coughs> um, I know how to justify that for the case of uh, the loop group of SUN and the loop group of SON. Uh, essentially, <coughs> based very strongly on on uh, the, the work of Anthony and. Uh, for the SO, sorry, SO2N case, spin 2 n case, um, type deep, that's what I mean, uh, <coughs> that's in the, in the two sequences of uh, the and, um, sorry? Um, sorry? So, so, what I, so what I know how to show is that uh, a conformal net has finite mu index if and only if its category of, represent of representations is a fusion category. So, so if you know that the category of representation is a fusion category, and you can find the of each one of them is realizable, then, then that's enough. Um, and uh, for, for the other ones, I need to 
share about that and read that. Sorry? That's right. So that there's the there's the there's Lowe who has a PhD about about those and recently uh, and who what's his first name, Sebastian? Who uh, did the corresponding work for super um, which three dimensional field theories are about? Uh, well the theorem of Jacob Lewis does not <coughs> say which ones you're going to get, so you get some of them. And there are some strong indications that you get um, extensions of uh, Cauchy Picking Theory and Cauchy Picking Theory assignments, but uh, this is not something that I really want to write here. Anyway, um, so, so when I say conformal net, uh, I like to take uh, what some people call a generally covariant point of view, or Think of it as coordinate three. So, okay, so here's a here's one way that uh, well, here's the way that, that most people would say what a conformal net is. They would say it's a thing that uh, to uh, each interval in S one assigns. Yes, uh, these are um, 
P1 round. Let's see which one I want. Um, I'm going to be conservative and take maps that are C infinity and that are uh, flat around the this is certainly not very relevant because at the end I'm going to take a phenomenon by competition. Just need to take something which is um, um, C1 will be enough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so this is going to be a An extension by S1 of this group here. Um, and the co cycle is what's the Lie algebra of this thing? Um, F and G are elements of the Lie algebra, which are maps from the interval into the Lie algebra of G, um, which is just, I guess, um, C infinity functions from the interval into the Lie algebra of G. And as I said, as I want things to vanish reasonably at the endpoints, here they're also going to vanish at the endpoints of the interval. And, um, so this is a well-known formula. The reason why I'm writing it down is to emphasize that it does not use any kind of coordinate on i. This is a function that's a one form. That's a, so f and bg together produce a diagram and the diagram valued one form using the basic inner carrying the uh, real valued one form. We can integrate the one form on an oriented manifold when we get the number due. I'm not using anything like the fact that this was embedded in S1 was not used in defining this group if you were thinking of it. And this is just the statement that the dimorphism of the circle uh, preserves the pure cycle on the group. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so we have this group here. The next step is to take the group algebra of that and when you form the group algebra of a central extension by S1, it is a good idea to mod out this algebra by the relation which will identify the S1 in the center of the group with the S1 in the scales. That's now just an algebra. I haven't completed it to anything, but it's it's already a pretty good approximation of the Von Neumann algebra that I want. Um, so here, this is identify. This is a twist of group algebra. I'm sorry. Exactly, exactly, except that I'm doing it maybe in a, in a way that's not optimal, but then first we build it the group, and then the group algebra of this bigger thing, which is too big, and then modding it out. Um, identify S1 in uh, the center. Actually need to go back to this picture uh, 
I don't know how to do it just intrinsically. <coughs> so uh, then what you do is you say, okay, uh, there exists this uh, representation of the loop group based on the standard model of S1, the backing representation. Pick an embedding of the interval into the circle to let it act on this vacuum representation. And that will tell you uh, which completion you want. So that will tell you which sequences of elements you want to view as Cauchy sequences. And then add, so, so that, uh, the, the, those, those convergent sequences will not depend, the, the statement of which ones you want to add does not depend on the interval, on the way you embed this interval in S1, and then you can form this for a natural completion. So, um, and I should say that there is, in some sense, a preservation of difficulty between these two pictures. Going from here to here does not make anything more easy. On the other hand, it does not make anything more difficult. So if there's something that was difficult here, it remains difficult, but if there's something that... There's something slightly difficult in that the truth cycle of the group is not the end of the group. We know the truth cycle of the group. I mean, oh, I... It can be defined uh, continuously on a neighborhood of the identity. Well, it's not locally, it's not because you can lift from the unitary group to the projective unitary group. That's right. But, um, so, um, but if you have a, a continuous cos cycle which is continuous on a neighborhood of the identity, that's enough to define a topology on a neighborhood of the identity of the centrally extended group, and then you can translate this topology to get a topology of To make oh, there is. A, I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a theorem that you cannot find a continuous cycle. That's right. that was the first because the because because the the the, the central extension is not topologically split. I think on those subgroups it could be split. Um, um, I would, I doubt that this is the case, even on these subgroups. Because you can check it on the L, but you might be able to solve that on the L. Because it, it, it reduces to a topological property of the group. Yes. Something in H4. And once you remove the interval, then you get down the L. Enough to build a co cycle from which you could reconstruct it. This is a topological group. Um, so, so, this is one class of examples. As, as you mentioned, you also have examples based on diffeomorphisms uh, of, of the interval, in which case it's a little bit more subtle because the co cycle is itself not. Very good with morphisms, but that's another story. Um, let me show you uh, a rather different kind of example. Um, uh, 
suppose A is a conformal net, for example, A is uh, this assignment here from I to this algebra, this is called A. Um, so, well, then there is a new example, A tensor opposite of A, which will take an interval and assign to it, surprise, surprise, the value that A assigns that interval, tensor to the opposite algebra, to that A, uh, to that an assignment from the possible non algebras, so it's a tensor product. And, uh, Whereas something like this, uh, one can think of as being a formalization of the concept of chiral conformal field theory. Uh, something like that, one should think of as being a conformal field theory with both chiralities. Um, so, it's just, just to say that the, the formalism is, uh, you, you, you can have both both chiral and non chiral CFTs that fit into this formalism and provide examples. What did you say the tensor product is? Uh, so, this is a von Neumann algebra, that's a von Neumann algebra. And if you have a von Neumann algebra, well, pick a Hilbert space on which this one acts, pick a Hilbert space on which that one acts, take the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces, and then look at the algebraic tensor product of those two algebras and put these in that. So this is the so-called spatial tensor product. Because first we've got the level of spaces, the Hilbert spaces, and then we look at the level of algebras. Anyways, so, so I mentioned this, this story with, um, with the three category at the beginning. I should maybe say a few words as to how it came to be. So this was a, a question by um, Stolz and Teichner. Um, it's difficult to know a precise date or when a question is formulated, but I became aware of it in 2004. Uh, and it was for, I mean, formulating it's a rather simple version of, of what they uh, wanted. Um, so they wanted to find a, uh, a three category, and to be more precise, a three category with a tensor structure, a symmetric model tensor, uh, a tensor three category. Um, let's call it C for the moment. And that we all know what this three category is going to be, such that. Not sorry? It's not pretending we don't know what a three category is, are we? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh. Well, uh, I, I, the answer to the question will be C is the three category of conformal nets, the three category whose objects are conformal nets. But uh, I'm phrasing the question in such a way. So <coughs> there is a tensor product, which means that there is a way of taking two conformal nets and producing another conformal net. Actually, I've used this tensor product here. This is the tensor product of conformal nets. Here it is. Um, and there's also a unit object, uh, which would be the net that takes an arbitrary interval and spits out the one-dimensional algebra of complex numbers. And that's all it does. Um, so, a HOM from an object in a three category to another object in a three category, well, what do you have? You have the arrows, and then between two arrows, you have 
things that go between arrows, and then between two of those, you have things that go on the other direction. So you still have, so in the three category, we have, we have four layers. We have the objects, the arrows, also called morphisms, the two morphisms and the three morphisms. And in this gadget here, we, we only have two layers, a three, we only have a two category. Um, so this is a two category, and what they wanted is for that to be the two category. of, well, uh, whose objects are bonomenaturas, whose arrows are bimodules, and whose two morphisms are um, maps of two bimodules, um, linear in both sides. So let me just call it the two category of on my mind. So, Andre, what did you mean when, when you wrote tensor three category here? You're, you're not, uh, uh, you just mean a three category where there's only one, ob one, one object, or, or did you mean that this is actually a four category? Uh, so, I mean, uh, actually, okay. uh, symmetric Interesting layers, <laughs> something like that. Um, there is a there is a, a piece of, of philosophy that says that um, if you have an n category with a tensor product operation, not necessarily symmetric, just associative, uh, this n category you can think of as being an n plus one category with a single object. Uh, so I think that's what you yeah, were referring yeah. to. Um, and then. If this thing is braided, then it goes up a little bit more, and if this thing is symmetric, then it goes up even more. Um, but um, it's not particularly relevant for this story. Anyways, um, okay, so so there is, okay, so and, and then the, the answer that we propose is to say that for all nets for a good candidate for, for, I mean, that's just a theorem that there is a three category that fits this bill and whose objects are conformal nets. Um, okay, so let me just spend two minutes on terminology. So, If you did the same thing uh, one level down, meaning if you start with a category of Bonhomme algebras and say, well, what is this if C is Bonhomme algebras? Then you get the category of trivial spaces. So, well, you would say, take the trivial Bonhomme algebra twice, which is the complex numbers and the complex numbers. And let's look at bimodules. Arbitrary, we get all inverse. Level, you will only see type 3 factors, except for this very. But if you go. Um, one level uh, further into that structure, then that's, there's no longer this. This, uh, this general fact no longer. 
Um, anyway, so here I'm just introducing some, some words because I want to um, use them further. Uh, uh, and here, those that will not be needing this talk, so I won't introduce their names. But just think of them like this. And this one you should have. So you have one of them. Another one. So, so you should imagine this as being some kind of, of surface where that's like a little bit uh, bulging up, and another one is a little bit bulging down. Then um, a free morphism is a thing that you would, you would put in the middle. Um, so here, at the location of these two points, you put the conformal net, and at the location of these two arrows, you put a defect, and then there's something between. Sort of higher analog of the two category of one-on-one atlas and binomials. So, so now, okay, imagine that. Um, so, I'm not going to tell you all the data that's there. That would be too ambitious for for today. Uh, so, imagine that you wanted to tell someone, like, what is the essence of this two category of one-on-one atlas and binomials? Um, but you wouldn't want, didn't want to like say everything. Um, so okay, there's a notion of an and there's a notion of bimodule. Uh, those are fairly easy to, to explain. Uh, and the thing that's really the most juicy in this in this two category is the way you're supposed to compose bimodules. This is a rather non-trivial operation, um, of which you presumably you've all heard of. With, with this audience, I'm supposed to call it confusion, but originally it was called uh, relative tensor product. Uh, and I'm going to try to do something similar here. So at this at this level, I also believe that the most non-trivial operation is the operation of composing of one, a composition of, of one morphisms, and all all the rest is just becomes very bulky, but it's it's simpler conception. Once you understand these defects and how they compose all the rest, it's sort of like, okay, then you need to like do a whole bunch of stuff. But this is the most interesting part, and that's what I'm trying to, uh, to convey right now. So, Andre, I don't really understand this question. I mean, it has a trivial answer. I mean, you just take a three category with, with one object called one, and you, <laughs> and you declare it's, it's, ah, it's yes, home category right, to be this right. thing. So, uh, what's the context? So, so okay. So, so, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on an interesting session, uh, this is this is one uh, sort of a cheap way out of that. Uh, what they really wanted, uh, so uh, what they really wanted is a uh, category such that. Um, the set of uh, invertible objects have isomorphisms form a cyclic group of order 576 uh, reflecting uh, the bot periodicity of topological modular forms. Uh, we're not there yet, but um, there is a, a candidate generator for that cyclic group. And I do not know whether or not it generates a signal group or something that's that's just a copy of Z. Um, maybe that candidate is the, the real preferred ones, the real preferred ones. But um, so there, there's more requirements, and, and there's some and, 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 and things line up pretty nicely with what you want, uh, even though.
So my next goal is to tell you something about the operation of fusion of defects. So if you have two conformal nets, A and B, and I have an A defect. Uh, what's this right here? <laughs> And uh, well, we need to find a, a symbol for that, so let's use this symbol. Um, this, this is going to be fusion over. Um, so if you think back here, um, so you have two bimodules and you want to fuse them to get the bimodule. Really, all you need to know is how to fuse a right module with a left module, and then the fact that it was a bi-module sort of comes along for the ride, and the resulting thing is going to be a bi-module. And something similar happens here. I may as well just tell you what happens if you have just have one conformal net around. Uh, so now suppose I have only a single conformal net, a, and um, I have a right, well, so a defect where there's only one net is the same thing as a, a defect for a, where I have here the trivial net on one side and an interesting net on the other side. And, uh, and if you uh, try to fit the terminology that is, is used in, in system of field theory, then I guess uh, boundary condition is um, let's see. everything like this. And uh, well, so we have here an action of the net A, we have here an action of the net A, we've used up these two actions, and we're now in this situation here, where we have only the trivial thing on both sides, which, is, which means I just have an action there. Um, so, left module versus right modules, it doesn't really matter. If you have a left module for a star algebra, you can always make it into the right module and vice versa. Um, and it's the same thing here. I mean, you can formalize the notion of left or right, but um, there is a sort of an evolution that will send one to one and the other to the other. Okay, uh, so now I'm supposed to tell you what these are. Um, and again, to make my life a little bit simpler, I will tell you what these are first. And that's sort of a doubled version of these. Okay, so definition and that, I would like to all be in one place. So I condition for A is, and it's not about a condition, it's just like a whole bunch of extra data, so anyways, um, uh, is, um, okay, so what do we have? We have the A is a map, 
actually a functor from the category of internals to the category of Um Let me view this as a subset of intervals with um, either no or one um, endpoint. kind of things that we have here are just intervals, they, um, also a picture of an interval, and the kind of things that we have here are uh, either the same as those or like here with a, with a little bullet at the end. I, I intervals do you mean closed intervals or open ones? Uh, closed, these are compact manifolds. No, 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 no. The definition of component yeah. is very important. Like intervals are open intervals. If you want to do it in closed intervals, Yes, I, I do require the components to be strongly averaged. Um, but they always tend to be, it's really dependable on the surface branch. And if it's not anything, you have to go back to the surface. And I'm, I'm, I'm yes, that's right. That's right. It's, it's, uh, so, so, so that's right. There exist control nets that are, that are not strongly additive, for which you can take the the union of the algebras for smaller and smaller intervals, and you can take the phenomena closer that you don't get everything. Oh, no, no, sorry. If you, uh, if, if you leave a point, sorry. I take back what I said. Uh, if you take two adjacent intervals and sort of generate inside that by sort of leaving a smaller and smaller, smaller gap that you won't get everything, and uh, I do not consider them. So, so when I say control net, implicitly I mean control nets with that property. Um, uh, okay. Let me give it a name. Extension So what is this? So before we knew how to evaluate these guys and now I'm saying I want to have some uh, Some new data some new algebra associated to those and you're sort of free to choose what you want The boundary position is the data of what you might want to assign to those and, uh, So let me uh, summarize so So the value of intervals like this, well, use the net A that's given, and the value of intervals like this, well, that's new data, which is the data of the condition. Um, so let me say a few more things about these. Uh, these intervals are oriented. Uh, the Morphisms in these categories are embeddings. Uh, orientation preserving embeddings go to Bonhamen algebra homomorphisms. Orientation reversing embeddings go to algebra anti homomorphisms. Um, and uh, one more technicality around this point here there's a little germ of coordinate. Uh, and uh, any embedding needs to be preserved to respect. You can embed something with a marked endpoint. That could be endpoint embedded with a big one. Yes. So, so a map from such a guy into another similar one needs to send this bullet point to the, to the bullet, the corresponding bullet point. Um, exactly. And the map from something like this into something like that needs to stay away from this point by at least some, by something positive. Uh, okay, so your, your definition looks, looks to me like exactly what uh, the really thinks about the 
this uh, characterization, boundary transition with the extension. Yes, they did it in the in the case of uh, maths on the on R11, on the plane, uh, where you cross the signature, and then sort of like draw a line, vertical line across this plane, and they say sort of know what happens in the bulk and the inside, and you want to have a thing that extends to this. Uh, that's right. Um, so, well, let me list the axioms for those guys. So, there's one, there's three that are going to fit here, and one that they'll have to go over there. Names. I certainly says that if I have an inclusion of a small one of those into another one that gets mapped to an injective homomorphism, injective. Homomorphism of one and algebras. Um, locality says that if you have two such guys that embed and they're in the images in, in this bigger interval or this joint, then uh, these go to. Commuting some algebras. This is a little bit of an abuse of notation because this map here is not required to go to an injective homomorphism. So the, the two images could be uh, some algebras. And this is not practical. Well, um, it's. Uh, I, just want to, I just want to allow some relatively uninteresting examples. For example, uh, a thing that will send this always the zero algebra. Well, why exclude it? You could exclude it, but I don't see any a priori reason to exclude it, so try not to exclude it. But, that's, but these are, you don't lose much of the, of, of the juice if you, if you assume that everything is injective. Um, there is strong additivity. Which says that if you have the same situation as here, these two pieces really touch in one point, then um, the two Generate the bigger one of it. Um, and finally, there is one which is a little bit more complicated. So 
So, so, so these are really k is the union along a single point. Um, okay, so we have the algebra d of i as a phenomenon. We can take the L2 space, that's a Hilbert space. That is a divided by module. Um, ah, one more piece of structure. Um, the reflection that sort of sends this here, let me call that little. And therefore, via little j, it's a um, d of i, I don't want to say it. So I could, I could say, instead of saying it's a bimodule, I could say it's a module over the tensor product of this and the opposite of that algebra. Which tensor product? We just got the right tensor product. The map J is an isomorphism between D of I of and this. So it's orientation reversing. Um, so we can do that. And then the requirement uh, Okay, so let's see. Let's restrict it to a D of J. D of J bar module, so I'm just like taking these away. These algebra, uh, algebra act and then ah, sorry, D of J is really the same thing as A of J because J are, are these kind of intervals. So this is really the same thing. This interval here has these two guys are as halves and sort of want them to line up nicely. Anyways, um, a bit complicated, but I just wanted to give you a complete list of, of our uh, working axes. Maybe I should give you some examples of, of these. The, uh, the extension you here, you require people to satisfy with. There is so not of course, you know, you have a local extension that's added, but uh, so I don't you don't need to have a thousand So there is there is the notion of uh, non-local extension of, of net. Uh, and out of such I mean that's a we have a net on the circle which is local, and we build a bigger net on the circle or on the line, which is not local. From that we use that as a starting of some construction that you then build the boundary condition on the half of the uh, Minkowski space. So, so that's right, these non-local nets show up, but they're used as a tool to then construct these, um, well, okay, 
And this is a parenthesis that begs your question. Suppose I have a non-local net of um, uh, a non-local extension on the line. This is the half of Minkowski space. Um, so you want to assign things in pieces that are like that, and you want to also assign things This, um, and what you are given is a local net A and a non-local extension B of the net A. Um, for this, uh, let's see if I'm going to get it right. assign to them A of this interval tensor A of that interval. Um, and then for this one you assign just Something in that format, I don't quite remember how it works. So I can look at that, but right now I don't have that. But here there's really no, no extensions of net whatsoever. I mean, there is no, an extension of net would assign new values to the same kind of intervals. And now I'm assigning the same values to, the same, to those intervals, and I'm introducing new kinds of intervals. So it's a rather different rather different construction. Um, so can you give an example? Of this? Yes. Uh, okay. So let me give you a few examples. So the covariance is there to tell you that you will have actions of diffeomorphisms of intervals. Uh, this is already built into the formulas by saying that it's a functor from intervals into algebras. So if I have a functor from something into something else, whatever acts on this side will act on that side. So you do those diffeomorphisms automatically out. So, well, so Sorry? Your theory is really a coordinatized theory. It's not coordinate free at all. Uh, very often the way to make things coordinate free is doing it for all coordinates out <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it's a matter of terminology. given a conformal net A, an arbitrary one, and then you can define Now I is one of these intervals with a marked point, and then you say, well, forget the marked point and just evaluate A, and that's um, an example. Um, other example. Given a conformal net A, uh, so this is a is um, a boundary. Given a conformal A, so okay. Now I have an 
my integral i that has this special point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to double it. And the place where the special point was, I'll just glue it to itself. Uh, and remember that there was a, a little germ of coordinate that allows me to put the, the smooth structure on this, on this thing. And that is a, a tensor A off bounded condition. If I evaluate it just on a piece here, I see two copies of A, except one has the orientation that I started with, and the other one has the other orientation. That's why it's off. So this is where you see that it's, it becomes useful to be able to evaluate on all kinds of intervals, because this interval is no longer embedded in anything. I mean, this one, say, was embedded in something. That one is not embedded. But it's still an abstract manifold that you can evaluate A on. Sorry? What's the relationship between this notion of boundary condition and the notion which would be a map from one to A your category and form a mass? They're the same. Yeah. Yes. yes. What do you was applying from the what was the definition of a boundary condition in this case? I don't remember what you mean. Okay, so if you have two conformal nets, A and B, there is a notion of A, B defect, which is a notion I have not told you what it is. Suppose you had it and you specialize to B being the trivial conformal net. Then you get the notion which is what I'm telling you here. And, uh, uh, well, I could spend the time to tell you what an A, B since I just want to pick out a few things, it's yeah. enough. Can I ignore, so if we ignore those lines, is an A tensor A off boundary condition? I don't know what that means. Sorry. Uh, this thing here? No, the lines are below it. This. So this is a, um, this is a conformal net. That was one of the examples of conformal net that I introduced in the beginning. And, uh, So, so what is this thing here? This thing here will, so I define it as saying, take an interval at i to a of i, the tensor a of i off. That was my definition of this thing here. But I may as well have said it, take little squiggly line here to a of, two copies of it, one with this orientation, one with that orientation. This is a sort of more, uh, I put it in quotes, what this means is that. But this maybe makes the connection between, between this and, and that. Sorry? It's not quite the, construct, the first construction. A tensor A of. I mean, this isn't the the second isn't the construction of A tensor A of. It's a well, it's a module for A tensor A. Given A tensor A of, I get a canonical module, which is the first example. Yeah. These okay, correct. So if these applying the first example to the case A tensor A of produces a boundary condition, which is not this one, which is another one, because yeah. because it's, it would be that without right. the glue. Um, is this the case of, I mean, on the circuit, you can keep this code properly in the stored intervals. They are a tensor point. So this is, that's why this is like a double, some double cup of the circle. It's a sort of like. Yes. So this, this 
which uses this, this, this property of nets, which uh, again, I'm not sure that it's always satisfied, but I certainly want to impose it on those nets that I consider, which is called the split property that says. That's how you prove it. It's about to find it. That's so right. you absolutely need that. But it's always true. I definitely. Um, um, Let me make a variation of this here, um, which is uh, going to take as input not just a conformal net, but a conformal net and an automorphism of this net. condition is, I need to tell you, given an inclusion of something into something else, I need to tell you which algebra homomorphism corresponds to that inclusion. So the value of this, under this construction, is A of, uh, let's call this one I and this one J. A of I tensor A of I of maps into A of double of J, or double of J is this, and the map is going to be uh, inclusion tensor uh, inclusion. Well, essentially, on one of the sides, you first compose the alpha. So, I like to think of these boundary conditions as being a sort of higher analog of a module. You have an algebra, that's a net, acting on a module, that's a boundary condition. This is the analog of an algebra acting on itself. So, any algebra A is an A module by left mobility. This is an algebra, of, this is an analog of an algebra as a module over A tensor A of, where you sort of the two actions together. Um, and this is an analog of that latter example, except a twist on one side by an automorphism. Um, okay, uh, final example is maybe um, Fix a phenomenon algebra M and take an integral and look if it's of, of this kind, the one that has, sorry, which kind? This kind, the one that doesn't have a little bullet at the end, just assign to it the complex numbers. And if it's the one that has a little bullet, assign to it that fixed algebra and do nothing else. So this is a is a boundary condition for the trivial. And that's how you view an arbitrary algebra. I believe, I believe that uh, the boundary conditions from conformal field theory have their counterparts in this in this thing. This is just the full boundary condition, which is a sort of very stupid one. Maybe this has nothing to do with the usual boundary conditions in conformal field theory. So I 
I'm not very confident in giving my answer, but I believe that what people in different form of field theory do will have a counterpart in this in this work. Uh, but this is this also contains this example that certainly has nothing to do with conformal field theory. It's just like a pure phenomenon that are sitting on its own. Or just as an example, if you took a lift group example, then uh, you could take the lift group which had a subgroup of the conformal condition network, right? It's certainly a boundary of the conformal boundary condition of conformal field theory. So you could ask it for some condition in the end. Yes. Uh, just perhaps uh, not beyond the bounds of possible lift groups, but just lie in a subgroup of something. So here's, well, since you mentioned it, one more example. Suppose I have an inclusion of two uh, conformal nets uh, coming from a conformal inclusion. Then you can say an interval without this little bullet maps to a value of the small guy and the interval with the bullet maps to a value of the bigger guy. I'm not sure that this exactly it would be, fits. That, that, that would be what that was saying. Okay. This is the example that you said. G contains, H contains in G, and then for the, uh, the AIs it would be LI of H, or the double complement of that, but BI would be LI of B. So you don't see the double in the middle. You don't see any. No, no end of the interval is kind of, there's nothing specific to any end of the interval. So, but probably, I think we should talk about that later. Yes, I do enjoy that. Um, let's see. Uh, so I know previous speakers have not received very clear answers to that question, but I asked it anyways. <laughs> uh, when should I stop or, or, or how? Well, you should probably just talk to the end of the Okay. Yeah, I know. That's, uh, <laughs> um, okay. So I tried to wrap this up. What I um, what I have to what I would like to, to tell you about is is how to take two of those and produce an algebra, or not an algebra. And then I also want to, that's just a construction, and then I have to say something about the construction to uh, I mean, ask a bit of fear and something, but we do with it. And uh, we'll try to fit that criterion also. So I like to think of Bonhomme algebras as being associated to one-dimensional manifolds and Hilbert spaces as being associated to two-dimensional manifolds. For example, D of an interval like this, if D is a boundary condition, if I take L2 of that algebra, that I like to think of as being double this interval with the Is, is, I think of this as being associated to that picture. I'm going to draw this picture and implicitly mean this. Similarly, if A is the conformal net, and if I value it on the upper half of some circle, take L2 of that, I'm going to draw it like this and I'm going to actually mean um, okay, so now suppose that I have two boundary conditions. I want to 
define this, which is supposed to be just a von Neumann algebra. And that is going to be the algebra generated by. Okay, so let's take. So I'm going to need two copies of this, one for D and one for E. So I'm going to be, let's see, these colors. So D is going to be green, E is going to be red. And if I have here green, I put the green point there, and I draw this thing all green. And that implicitly means that I've used it. Um, so now I take. And so that's this guy for D, except facing the other way. That guy for E. And the fact that I'm putting them next to each other along a line means that secretly what I'm doing is I'm taking this. Confusion over A of this middle interval. With that. So that's a favorite space. Um, this interval here in the middle no longer acts, but um, I certainly have an action of this part that part. So um, it's really generated by E of this piece, including the end point there, and E of that, including this one here. First step, build this different space. Second, look at that algebra and that algebra. They act. Let them generate for another algebra. Um, okay, great. That's just the definition. Now uh, let's uh, formulate something about it. Uh, for that, I will need to tell you what the new index of a control net is mentioned it briefly in the beginning, but without really saying what it was. Um, A is a conformal net. The mu index is defined to be the dimension of, I take this inverse space here, and Viewed as a bimodule over one side, this algebra acts, and on the other side, that algebra acts. And if I want to stay with conventions, I need to take a square, but that's really secretly the index of. Here, and then I have a content of. Is this just another way of writing secretly I squared for convection and all the units of the representation of the original name? That's correct. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a non trivial statement that this, is, that this is indeed the case. Yes. Um, okay. And I'll finish by 
may be here. So, so if you have a, a defect, two defects B and E, it makes sense for them to take values in factors. In this algebra here, V of an interval, if it's not a factor, you can really just split it into factors and it's not terribly interesting. So uh, let B be uh, factor value. So this operation here is a generalization of the operation of spatial tensor product. If the, if the net A was a trivial one, I will just get the spatial tensor product. The spatial tensor product sends factors to factors. Um, and the question is, well, do I get a factor out of this construction? Um, and the answer is no, not always. There are examples where you don't get factors. It's a direct sum of most factors. So you sort of, and, and, and you can get up to mu of a in certain cases. This is um, so that's something I can say about those. Um, say more about that, but probably now is a good moment to stop. Are there any questions? So, if I think of the, um, having the boundary condition that should define, if the boundary condition is an edge right? the finiteness that should define a two-dimensional field theory, topological the values in your and then this tensor product is just a ordinary two-dimensional field. So what, do you know what kind of field theories you get? So if, if indeed there's enough finiteness. Yeah, so this is an example where you do have enough finiteness. This is all you know. Assuming A has finite field that uh, in this code that does have that. A is an AAR. Yeah, exactly. Um, yes. um, and then the topological the field theory is kind of boring. It says, well, take a manifold in boundaries, double it, double it, and do this folding thing and evaluate the theory as it's been um, In some other examples, um, I'll get, get something that I'm not sure what, what, what to say about it in general application. Any other questions? 